The following interview was conducted with Professor William D. Buffington, Professor Emeritus of Russian for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Monday, January the 26th, 2009, in Stewart Center 263. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you. Thank you. And tell us a little bit about where you were born and your parents in early years. Surely. I was born in Gary, Indiana and uh, soon moved to Valparaiso, Indiana, where I w attended the uh, Valparaiso schools and graduated from Valparaiso High School in 1948. Tell us a little about high school. What was that like? Uh, your activities? And oh, large uh, yeah, I was in a debating club there at the time, the drama club, that sort of thing. Um, I uh, was interested in chemistry. Uh, I know I had some very good teachers, especially in mathematics. I really uh, cherish those memories of old Miss McGillicuddy and how she made me show all the work of all the work I did, and uh, that helped me a great deal later on when I went down to went to Purdue. Uh, in my senior year, uh, I had applied for Purdue University, and I realized that I would have to have some sort of a a scholastic help, a scholarship help. So I uh, became involved in a laboratory experiment which I wrote up and presented to Purdue University. Uh, and I was uh, lucky enough to win the, a, uh, a scholarship to Purdue in the amount of $800 for the year, uh, which I should tell you paid for all the expenses at Purdue in 1948, that was. That covered tuition and it covered housing. And the fees. Eight hundred dollars and the fee. Eight hundred dollars. Right. Tell us what sort of a laboratory experiment for the researchers. What sort of experiment? <coughs> was that, that was the. Uh, uh, I investigated the. If I remember right now. The uh, solubility of grinding wheel materials in hydrofluoric acid. Uh, apparently, that was important to the. the this particular um, lab, and um, I, I wrote that up and presented that, and I was awarded that scholarship. Now, as you might imagine, I did not stay in chemistry, but uh, at Purdue. But my first two years, I was in chemistry, and I had, of course, the uh, chem labs in the old uh, FWA buildings there on Stadium, and uh, and but after a couple of years. I sort of dropped out of chemistry and went into, believe it or not, history. But, uh, of course, Purdue in 1948, that uh, looks a little different than it does now. If I remember right... Was this the year you entered Purdue in 48? Yeah, I think we had about 10,000 students, 10 to 12,000 students. Uh, and the campus, uh, of course, was uh, adorned by the beautiful American elm trees, uh, which we, uh, I think, was which were lost in the late 50s to that... Uh, Elm disease they had, but uh, I came down to Purdue, and uh, I was a late registrant. I remember, and I don't know if they know where to put me, but they assigned me. I was assigned by uh, uh, Jack Smalley, who was, of course, the, uh, uh, involved in the housing, uh, student housing at that time, to Oliver Perkins Terry House. Terry House was located there on Waldron Street. It's now the Acacia Fraternity. At that particular time, it was a uh, housing unit of 36 guys. So it's a, it's a, it's almost like a fraternity. Because uh, I had no idea. I, I could have been assigned perhaps to, uh, to Carey Hall, because that was all there was, was Carey Hall. And then, of course, they had some, uh, they had some again, FWA buildings where uh, students were housed uh, and uh, so Terry House was an important experience for me for the four years I was here at Purdue. Uh, I was not in a large dormitory by any means but we, we had our uh, own house and we had a house mother and it was kind of like a fraternity in a way. Sure. Did they do the cook you have cooking there? Did yes, the, okay. the, the cooking uh, was done, had the same menu that they had at Cary Hall. And I should tell you, in those years, uh, students were served at the evening meal uh, by waiters. Uh, we had waiters as well. They were the guys in the hall at, at, in, the, in, the, in Terry House that we, we took turns. 
uh, in the um, we always dressed coats and ties for the evening meal. And in the uh, dormitories, that was also Cary Hall, or which we call, we call the women's halls, was north and south, and one other one I forget. Uh, the women, of course, uh, uh, hose and heels. And that was the formal dress, and coats and ties for the men. And uh, it has changed since then. Quite a bit. Quite a bit. Right. And, well, my goodness, we even had a little uh, uh, thing passed around about table manners, how we were supposed to even butter the bread. You must understand you take the bread and break it into four pieces and then butter each individually. And we sat down at the tables, and there, there, all, the, all the plates would be in front of the table head, and the uh, meal that we brought in, the food would be brought in different dishes, and that would be served by the table head. And he would pass the, t the dishes around until all were served. Then he would place his fork on the table, on, a, on the, uh, his dish, and then we could eat. That's a long time ago, isn't Interesting. it? Interesting. It's like family style. It was a family style kind of mm -hmm. thing. Now, I don't know if they did that in all the halls or not, but that's what we did in Terry House. Mm -hmm. Terry House remained uh, a residence for men until the uh, late 50s. I don't know when the uh, Acacia uh, fraternity bought it or not. Uh, Oliver Perkins Terry was a prominent Purdue person. What his function was at Purdue, I no longer remember. But when he, uh, the house was established by him and his wife, and as long, we always said as long as Mrs. Terry lived, the house would remain a residence hall in Purdue because the stipulation, this was what we thought anyway, the stipulation of the will was that some uh, building uh, would have to bear his name. Now at this time, of, even now, the Purdue Police Department is supposedly in Oliver Perkins Terry building. And if you go there, and I, I went there some years ago, and I, saw, I don't know if it's still there, there is the uh, door knocker from Oliver Perkins Terry hanging in the police department. And we, uh, as freshmen in Terry House, we had to keep that polished. That was one of our jobs. Because we were treated much like pledges were, even mm -hmm. though we weren't, but sure. we were. But we had to do different things. And that's when, remember, I brought the uh, box full of uh, uh, the uh, Purdue pot. We always had to make sure we wore our green pot during that year. And that, now that has changed quite a bit. But exactly. freshmen had to wear the pot. And, uh, and of course, the seniors wore cords. But, the, of course, the seniors did not put on their cords until the first homecoming game. Uh, and the freshmen uh, in Terry House and other places, the idea was to uh, find those cords because the seniors hid them in places where the freshmen could find them, of course. Mm -hmm. And then the freshmen would decorate the cords with, with different designs, paint on them and the various things. And then the seniors would put on those cords. So the freshmen were ones involved with the designing and yeah. putting those. Yeah. And then, of course, uh, some seniors would then uh, add their own decorations. But the, uh, so, so there was, I, so I don't know what you want to call the kinds of activities we were engaged in, uh, which are largely, largely disappeared. But in, in those years, uh, all the organizations, or not all of them, but most of them, would have a, a pledge class and they were, uh, some of them would have different kind of insignia or they would carry around different emblems, uh, pledge boards of various types, which had to be uh, small pledge boards, had to be signed by the actives uh, and before you finished your pledge, train, uh, pledge period. And the pledges were uh, then, you would see them in those years at noon in various clubs singing on campus or conducting Purdue cheers on campus. Now, uh, for example, the Reamers, and, for, and it's not too long ago they were still doing that, would sing at the, at the Lions. Uh, 
there on campus. Uh, the Gimlets, which were the first the fraternity organization, I could just see them singing on the steps of what we call the executive building, which is now Hubby Hall. The steps would be covered with these guys, and they'd be singing. Uh, the, um, the honorary for the uh, Naval ROTC would be at the Naval Armory, which of course is gone. Uh, and uh, the Gold Peppers, who, which was the uh, organization for women, would be singing on the west steps of the Union. And they would carry around uh, not only these, they, each of these organizations not only had their own distinctive pledge boards, but about the size of a eight by eight and a half by eleven, it wasn't quite large, but the, the Gold Peppers would carry around a gold pepper, which was, of course, a green pepper hollowed out, filled with wax, and gilded with gold, gold paint. And they would carry those things around. Uh, and also, they would carry around a pledge box, which was filled with candy. Now, the candy was for the actives. So when you went, went, showed up at noon, and I don't remember, it seems as if we, since I was in the Reavers, I, I think we did that every, every, every day. Anyway, um, we have to display the boxes, and they have to be filled with candy because the actors are pretty hungry. And there was various penalties, we didn't have the right kind of candy. And when, they, when you got these signatures on the pledge board, the, the actors sometimes refused to sign them. I'm not going to sign them today. I signed one. I'm not going to sign the rest of it which meant it extended the, the period of which you had to go around seeing these people. Because you had to get the signature for every, everybody. Oh, my, all yes. The and also of all of the honoraries. The honoraries included various professors on campus. They, uh, they uh, um, included uh, people in, on, in the community who were known to support Purdue athletics. Uh, included, of course, President Hubdy's name, we had to get his name, uh, and uh, all, I can't, can't remember, seems to me, uh, uh, Mr. Kirby's name was on that, and uh, Doc Anderson, I guess I'm starting to forget those names, but there mm -hmm. were a number of people in the community uh, that we had to go and, and introduce ourselves and tell a little bit about ourselves and get their signature. So that was a kind of an interesting Experience. The pledge period lasted, uh, it was in the fall semester. You were, you were pledged in the fall semester and you were activated to the duty center. So it would like. run through the whole fall semester? Yeah, it would run through the whole fall semester. Okay. And uh, I remember for the Reamer Club in the pledge, uh, when the pledge period came to an end, so we'd meet every Monday night in the union and we'd have to, uh, the actors, of course, would be in one room. And the pledges would be in the other room getting their instructions on which Purdue songs they had to learn, which Purdue yells they had to learn in about Purdue traditions. We had to know all kinds of things about Purdue. And then they would, uh, this is at least what the Reamers did at that time, they would then uh, bring us into the actives in which we were orally harassed by all the actives that were shouting at us and asking us to sing songs and asking us, what is this, what is that about Purdue? and generally uh, tried to make us feel we knew nothing. Uh, but, uh, but, uh, and then at the end of the pledge period, we'd have the initiation. And at that time, we would, believe it or not, this happened on Purdue campus. We would have to carry lanterns, you know, a kerosene lantern. Each of us had a lantern. And we had to march across campus, saying R-E-A-M-E-R-S, and we would have to carry those lanterns at night, and we wind up in the Purdue Union at the sweet shop, at which time we would sing Purdue songs, or any other song uh, that was popular at that time. On top of Old Smokey, I remember that one. And of course, the actors is standing around, again, harassing us, not, you know, not singing loud enough, or not singing well enough, or making us sing it again. But uh, then we would uh, go to bed exhausted because of late tickets late at night and then we get up in the morning to a breakfast and uh, again we of course had a coat and tie and so forth and, 
and welcome and so forth and everything would be okay and then of course it would repeat the next time but I have to tell you one story I, I remember this so very well in 1950 uh, it was just before the IU Purdue football game and uh, in the past there had been incidents in which those guys from Indiana University would come up to the Purdue campus and paint their emblems or signs and so forth on buildings of the Purdue campus to, to stymie these bad guys from IU. Uh, 1950, just the, the, before the, uh, well, I think week before the IU Purdue football game, the, uh, we decided to protect campus. The Reamer Club was going to do this and others as well. So I was a pledge to the Reamer Club at that time. And I remember standing in the entryway of Stanley Colder Hall, the biology building then. It's kind of ironic that I, I then spent all my academic career in the same building. Standing behind those pillars of Stanley Colder Hall with my Reamer paddle, waiting for those guys from Indiana University to just try to do any painting on any buildings. And we actually had a radio station set up in the basement of Stanley uh, Terry House, in which with walkie-talkies and, and radios, we were communicating all across the campus. We had patrols everywhere. And there was a report. They were coming down 52. They were coming. And you know, they never came. No one ever showed up. We stayed up all night and no one ever showed up. It might have been because I think President Hubde and whoever the president, might have been President Wells, you know, he was there forever, indicated any student found on the other campus doing any evangelism would be expelled. And that might have happened. But you can see that had happened before the painting uh, it occurred. So that's what we did in those years. Now, when I look at the 38,000 some students on campus now, I think, my goodness, that was a different time. We were uh, having more fun, perhaps. I don't know. Yeah. It was lots of activities. It was lots, yeah. lots of activities. Right. And the activities, of course, it was interesting that you see 48, that was three years after the end of the war. There were leaders in these activities who were much older than we were because they were veterans. And I mean, they were old guys, like 23 and 24. And they took leadership roles, and they were very good. They were very good students, as I think uh, if any professors can remember that time. They were very good students, and they were very good leaders. And uh, so it was, uh, these activities were, were important to us at that time. And we worried about such things as uh, produce spirit and how to get students more involved and supported the team. I mean, we would have the... Uh, at homecoming time, of course, we have homecoming signs on every residence, in every fraternity, in every sorority. And Terry House even won first places, prizes for their signs. Quite elaborate. They'd uh, have the displays and things. Right in front of the house. Uh, the one sign I remember we, it was all the way to the top of the house, second story. But we had engineering students who were, uh, could rig motors to run things and make things move. And, Lights to come on, and, and uh, uh, so we had the we had the know know how to do this, and then there would be a judging, and the in the uh, prizes would be announced at the football game, mm -hmm. and uh, Terry House won two years in a row with that, but the uh, used to be quite elaborate signs. I mean, the, and then we, uh, I I remember the signs were still being put up in the early '60s because I was asked to judge them one time by some students. But uh, I don't know if anybody does that anymore. I mean, they might hang out a sheet or two, but that, that's about it. But the, uh, then we would have a parade uh, led by the Boilermaker Special, uh, and we'd go down to the levee, which, because the levee was the levee. There was nothing down there, a few gas stations on the corner. But the levee, the Sears, Sears Roebuck was not even there yet. And we would have a pep rally. And of course, uh, it, for the Indiana game, we would have Miss Indiana, uh, which would be burned, who would be burned at that time, with a bonfire. And 
Miss Indiana, of course, uh, would lie in state in the Union Building, guarded by the ROTC. I don't know if they do that anymore. Don't think so. Not for a number of years. Not for a number of years, but that's uh, kind of kind of things I remember. Of course, I remember my professors as well. Oh, I remember registration. We would go into the armory, and there would all be all these tables in the armory, and behind each table would sit several professors with a uh, box of cards, IBM cards, I think. And you'd go up and you'd say, I, I want to be, say, in well, you've gone to your advisor, and he would write down what the courses you ought to take, and you, you, you didn't know what your schedule was. So you had to kind of make your schedule yourself. You'd go in with this card and say, well, I want a German 51. It had strange numbers in And it would look in there. This German professor would look in this, by departments, of course, he'd organize by, he would pull out, here's German 51 at that particular time, and he'd give you this card. And he would assemble them, and then turn them in, and then it would run through the computer whatever was the device that they had for uh, reading these things, and that would be your schedule. Well, you could also get to that place and you want math such and such, and they would say, we're out. It's full. The class is full. You have to pick another one. And that might just mess your schedule up because it's, it would be at a different time. Now, the way they kept track of that in the armory, they would have this huge board put at one end of the armory and had all the classes listed there of the entire university. And as the, the sections filled, they would put a red card in front of the number of that particular section. So when you walked into the armory, I remember the saying was, you looked at that board, and if it's all full of red cards, you say, the board is bloody. You're going to wind up with Saturday classes, 7 o'clock classes, not 7.30, 7 o'clock classes, and it's just a terrible schedule, or you might not be able to take that particular course. You have to go back to see your advisor. It was quite a laborious, a little bit different than sitting down at a computer. It was a laborious I'd say schedule. So. Right. I would, but I remember we had classes started at 7, 8, and 9. And of course, uh, freshman students usually got in there the last, and they got the worst schedules. So they would get such things as a, um, a, a surveying lab at 7 o'clock on Saturday, three hours, 7 to 10. I remember Vice President Hakama, who said that he, uh, administrators at that time often would teach one class, and uh, a president, a Vice President Hakama would teach a, a course in engineering, and he always scheduled at 7 o'clock, because he wanted dedicated students to come. And he said, we started promptly at 7. As a matter of fact, if anybody came out late, or came in late, they would have to sit in a special place in front. And he called it the jackass rule. That's what he said. I'm quoting him now, you see. Um, I think President Hovde taught class in engineering as well. But uh, they, were, uh, they were academic people as well. I remember, of course, uh, George Davis, uh, who was the, uh, I don't know if we called him Dean of Students then or not, I don't know what his uh, title was, and uh, Jack Mallet, is it Jack? Don Mallet, and uh, Mr. Titchener, and Mr. Greer, those are all the, the people, in it. and I don't remember the names of, I think it could have been uh, uh, Dean Schliemann, Helen Schliemann in, in for the Women. Yeah. If I go back far enough, I think that's what I was. Sure. But the interesting thing is I came back to Purdue to teach in 1961. That's a nine-year break. I graduated in 52. Went into the Army. I was, by that time, a history major. I went into the Army. I went to the Army language school in Russian. I came out of the Army. I served in Germany in the military intelligence. Came out of the Army in 56. I uh, went back, went up to the University of Minnesota in Russian history. And then Sputnik came along in 57. And by that time, I had switched to uh, teaching Russian education. And I was recruited then by uh, Dr. Hockey in 1961 because the Russian, they needed people in Russian. So they, they, I, did, I, well, I had two bachelor's degrees. I didn't even have a master's degree. 
but they needed people. And I had been trained in the latest uh, methodology of teaching foreign languages uh, in the late 1950s, the audiolingual method. And so he wanted somebody who, who knew that method, and so he brought me in. And then eventually I got my master's degree and my PhD in foreign language education from Purdue University. So I wound up with two bachelor's degree, one master's degree, and a PhD. When did you get your PhD? 1971. You? I was a slow learner. But you see, when you were teaching. I was teaching. Right. It was the interesting thing because a number of us did that. We were uh, hired on as instructors, and um, as long as we made progress towards a, deg a degree of some sort, uh, we, were, we were retained. I don't think I could get tenure anymore with the emphasis now on academics and publishing, but if we, if we were recognized as teachers, we were kept around, so to speak, with the idea we eventually would finish. So uh, uh, that's what I did. And, uh, uh, and of course, when I started teaching at Purdue, uh, the, our department was known as a service department. We were teaching courses so that others, like engineers and people in science, could take foreign languages to meet a requirement. In science, they had a two-year foreign language requirement, and I don't know what they have now. That was the School of Science, as we called it. And uh, by that time, we are, wait a minute, how was that? That was the first year we were still together with science, and they, then they formed Humanities, Social Science, and Education, 62 or 63. They broke away, so science went one way, and went, but they still had a foreign language requirement as did humanity, what we called humanities, or what we called HSSE at that time, H-S-S-E. Uh, and then, uh, of course, this education is broken away now, and uh, so now we have liberal arts. Uh, what was your department called then? Was it foreign? foreign uh, modern languages, Department of Modern Languages. When, uh, when it was in the humanities, social science, and education? That's correct. And uh, when I came, we were, uh, the department emphasized teaching, and I remember Dr. Hawking said that President Hovde said to him, the, the Dr. Hawking, what can your department do for the teachers of foreign languages in the state of Indiana? There's always that idea of service. The emphasis was on service. We did not have a graduate program at that time. That's 1961. Things began to change in the mid-60s. Uh, they begin to have a graduate program, you know, first this language and this language, and then the others were starting out in Spanish. That meant we would have teaching assistants. When I came to Purdue in 61, there were no teaching assistants. I taught 16 hours a week, 16 hours a week. And I thought that was great because I spent the previous year teaching in a junior high school in St. Paul, Minnesota, in which case, you were teaching more like 30 hours a week, right? Uh, and uh, it was quite a challenge. And that experience always, uh, always kept saying, wow, you guys, you professors, you would never last a minute in a junior high school. <laughs> you would never last a minute. So because you had to be on your toes all the time, of course, you had to be ahead of the students. Uh, and you, of course, you had discipline problems as well. But uh, when I came in 61, the emphasis was on service. And gradually, it's changed. And I remember uh, talking to a younger member of faculty in 1980s, and he said things like, well, you re must remember that we are primarily a research department now, in the, par the Department of Foreign Languages and Literature. And literature. And we were modern languages. We taught French, German, Spanish, and Russian. And that was it. And then we began to teach Latin. And I remember there were people saying, well, wait a minute. We can't teach Latin because John Perdue's will stipulated that no Latin would be taught at Purdue. He didn't like Latin. And that went around for a while. We went ahead and taught Latin anyway. And of course, it turns out that John Perdue died without a will. There was no such stipulation. And I know. But I have talked to people during people coming back to the reunion, and you know, they find out Oh, you're teaching Latin now. I thought John Perdue said you couldn't teach Latin. I said, no, we're teaching Latin. And then, what was the next language? I think it was, uh, I don't remember now, but we began in the, of course, the late 70s. 
you know, in the 1980s, we began to add things like Japanese and Chinese, and then uh, Hebrew and Arabic and Greek, classical Greek, and classical Hebrew, I should say, and uh, Portuguese, and I probably have left out something. But uh, it's become quite a large department. Uh, when I came, as I said, we had no teaching assistants. And if not I'm mistaken, there are now 100 teaching assistants in Spanish alone. And that's how the department has grown. It's really grown. It's the size of a small university right now. And uh, now, not in Russia now, but the Russian enrollment when I we started, that was right after Sputnik, of course. Uh, we had, a, I can remember, we started with five sections of Russian. Now it's down to one or two. Uh, whereas the enrollments in the other languages, in Japanese and Chinese, are way up in Arabic, and maybe that's a reflection of the end of the Cold War, I don't know. But it's, I've seen quite an evolution. This is not only at Purdue, but across the United States. There were uh, universities which were uh, abandoning, dissolving Slavic departments because of the low enrollments. And we've held, we've held on, and hopefully we continue to hold on. Why did they change, how did they have, why did they feel they should change the name of the department? I'm thinking for the researchers, they might wonder. Um, yeah, that's because, the because we wanted to, uh, we had fewer, fewer courses in literature when I started. Uh, and there, as I say, it was largely a language training, if you wish, linguistics and so forth. Right. Uh, I remember there would be a, an occasional course in German, Goethe, literature. Uh, but now we have a full range of courses in the literature, therefore they changed the language. And they wanted to change so it's foreign languages so they could in, uh, uh, add other languages, such as Latin and uh, classical Greek and so on, which were not modern languages, we said. When did that occur? Mid-60s. Mid-60s, I think it was. But our department head was Dr. Dr. Don Walther at that time. And he was very instrumental in making that change over. Uh, and I remember one of the professors who looked back in the years when I first started, he said that was the years of the purgatory of being a service department. <laughs> but then. Tell us a little bit about some of the things that, the changes and things in the department, how that you were in this in the department. Well, when we, in 19, uh, see what I uh, was at Purdue. Did you also travel? I did in 63 and 65. Uh, in 1965, I was in an exchange program of teachers uh, and, and spent uh, nine weeks at the University of Moscow uh, because that was a very, very important. I, mean, I was going to say uh, it w about when I came in 61, uh, St uh, Coulter Hall had just been renovated in 1960. Prior to that time was a biology building. And I, interesting enough, when I was here at Purdue, I took biology in the same building. We had about this big lecture room. And of course, we had the arrangement. You had a lecture, then you had a lab, which I think is still around. But I remember he was, so, and the professor at that time, don't remember his name, he had to sit in alphabetical order. And I was in that class for about six weeks, and I realized I was Buffington, I was about the second row, and there's Bob Reed. He was in Terry House with me. He was way up high there in the back row, because he was R, and I didn't even know he was in the same class. We lived in the same house, and he was in the same class. I didn't know it. They renovated in 19, oh, I should tell you, Colder Hall, or biology building then, had all the labs, and they had all these cases with stuffed animals in. And as you walked down through the basement, particularly where you had labs, you had the smell of formaldehyde. Of course, which all the preservatives they had there. But anyway, they renovated and got it. You see, there were an array of buildings at that time. Uh, to the east was Chemistry Annex, and that's gone. That's the chemistry building now. Into the, into the west was the Biology Annex which became Stanley Kohler Annex after they renovated, and then there was Purdue Hall, or the Bath Building now. And so I had classes in the Foreign Language Department, Mounted Language Department was in Purdue Hall. So they renovated Kohler Hall, gutted it, 
and pulled the uh, language teachers, uh, the 20 of them or so, into Calder Hall. And in Calder Hall, they, they installed the, probably the, the most modern language laboratory in the United States. That was Dr. Hawking's baby. He was very well known in the United States. He was a giant in foreign language education. Uh, and he, of course, it was federal money. This was the National Defense Education Act, NDA Act, of those years because they thought we had to, if you remember, after Sputnik, we had to catch up with the Russians. We had to teach science, math, and foreign languages. So let's get all the money we can get. And he was able to get uh, the funds to establish the, the best language lab in the country. There were, there were three labs. There was that in that room where I had taken biology. They now had, ins yeah, that's right, they had in installed these huge tape recorders. Now, audio tape, I don't know if I have to explain what that was <laughs> anyway. Uh, and they were, we know they were $15,000 a piece, four of them. $60,000, that was a lot of money back in 1960, a lot of money. And in the other two labs, they had another arrangement, which I can't really recall clearly. But anyway, the students would sit in those labs with earphones and listen to recordings of their foreign language. And in those years, the idea was you listen and you repeat and you learn. That was the idea. So they would hear and record. They would hear the, Spanish, the voice in Spanish. They were supposed to say that phrase. And then in their individual booths, they would have the microphone there, which would record on these big master machines their voices. And then they could play it back, but they all have to play it back at the same time now. And they were supposed to listen and compare and improve. Uh, studies later showed that that wasn't really being done. First, there was a lot of silence in the lab. <laughs> you didn't hear, but it wasn't really very effective. And within about five or six years, they took those machines out. We went to another system there. Now, those labs have been converted to offices and the big lab is still there, except it's all computers. All computers. They tore out the booths, they tore out the, the risers and so forth, and uh, it, it's all computers now. And in many of the rooms, which were classrooms then, are now computer labs, where students come in. But they're, they're, they're used by all students now from across the country. Uh, open labs. Open labs, yeah. And of course, Calder Hall has now got the completion of the, uh, of the buildings in the back. It was done in 19, uh, or whatever it was done, finished up. And of course, uh, I saw that because I retired in 95, and they were just starting that. And I saw also them tearing down Stanley Kohler Annex, the old biology annex, and putting up the class of 50 building. But when I had come back from Purdue, 1961, Purdue Hall was already gone. And uh, um, Hevelin Hall was down the old Heaven Hall, where I had classes too. And uh, I should tell you at that time, we used to define a true boilermaker like this. A true boilermaker is that guy who can stand with his girlfriend in front of Heaven Hall at midnight. And when they started to chime mid midnight, he could run with his girl, carry her to John Perdue's grave, kiss her, and run, carry her back to Heaven Hall before the final stroke of 12. I don't think anybody ever did that. <laughs> but I should tell you, a John Perdue's grave, of course, was on present place, of course. And the mall was there, but it was all grass. By tradition, you did not cross the mall. You went on Hello Walk, which was, of course, like a bow around the head outside. Right? We didn't have the, the sidewalks across. That was because uh, we did, you only had 12,000 students. When you have more buildings going up west, that put a lot of pressure. The library was to the east. And all these classes were at the west. That meant people were crossing that. And I think they just said, we have to put in the blocks. The library, of course, was in a much smaller building. And I was wondering, are we now in that old library section?
every uh, the old section would go goes includes the stacks. Okay, okay. I remember the stacks. I remember the stacks yeah, very the well. The building, the original building, was built in 1913, and you probably yeah. see we have pictures in the library. Yeah, it's and they had an elevator in there, world's slowest elevator. Uh, and I guess I guess it's still there. If, if people are brave enough to get on the thing, right. we're not going to do that. But the uh, that, and of course Eliza Fowler Hall was right next door. Now that building's completely gone, and it's part of now the Stewart Center. But it's called, I think, Fowler Hall, is it not? Still, they're retaining these some of these names, still, and uh, so the, when I came back, Crew Hall was gone, the Armory was gone. Uh, where was the original? Where was the Armory located originally? Uh, well, I tell you this story: the Naval Armory had a naval gun in front of it, aimed this right directly at the Alpha Z Delta House, yeah. and that's on uh, University. And um, that would be 6th Street. That would be uh, Alpha Chi Omega. It was on the corner then in Alpha Z Delta, the corner of 6th and University. Well, right across there, a little bit down, was an evil armory, and they had this gun. It was pointed directly at the Alpha Z Delta house. And there's always a threat to fire the thing. Of course, they didn't do that. But that whole area behind there where the... Um, pharmacy building now is, and that was just a field. We used to play touch football on that field. There. Of course, the Army was still there. I, I Oh, by the way, in those years when I came here, uh, ROTC was obligatory. You either were in the band or in the ROTC. And I took ROTC for two years. Of course, you had a four-year program. I took it for two years. And the band, of course, was a, a arrayed in military-style uniforms, and, and including the, the three cheerleaders. That was it. And Pop, uh, Spots Emmerich, of course, was the uh, director. director at that time. And he conducted it. And when they uh, went into their uh, spelling out Purdue, or the P, I guess, uh, the marching P, that was the first time supposedly anybody had ever done that. It was a military it was a military unit because it's supposed to be a substitute for that military training. Although I should tell you, when I went in the army, it did do me some good. It did do some good. But uh, I kind of wandered. No, you're fine. Okay. Um, did the graduate program in, program increased in your department and uh, the yeah, department? Well, we have quite full a bit. PhDs and all. All right. uh, all, the, all the wait a minute I, on the four major languages. PhD, I think. And I think they're developing PhDs in some of the other languages. They now have professors, uh, and tenured professors in Japanese and Chinese, and uh, I think probably Arabic, and uh, well, in classics certainly. Classics is, is shown now. This is Latin and, and classical Greek. Mm -hmm. and they're still teaching the Russian, though, aren't they? Yeah, they're still teaching the Russian. See, for years. Uh, one of the things I did in the department was give foreign language entrance examinations. I did that for 25 years. And uh, what did that entail? What was that? What the, well, Purdue's freshmen come on day on campus for four weeks, and they uh, uh, they were going to enter a foreign language class. They had to take a foreign language placement test so we could put them in the right place because we were attempting to encourage uh, we put them in the right course. Uh, we were in, to encourage the teaching of foreign languages in, in, in high school, and uh, we wanted them to make use of their experience in high school. And we had tried to place some different courses by administering in that language lab, which it was now changed. We now had recorders in the front console, and the students put on earphones, and they would hear uh, a test in Spanish, German, and French. Or Russian, and they would mark their book in their booklets, and then they had a reading exam, all multiple choice, and then uh, uh, I'd collect the booklets and the all oh, use IBM cards, um, and you with a marking pencil, number two pencil, fill in the little places there. I guess I don't know if they do that anymore, but we wouldn't score those with the machine. I had a very good secretary. Her name was Anna Bakhtari. She was from Hungary. And she knew Russian and she knew German. And she was very good and very systematic. 
She was the one that ran the place, really. She would collect those cards and have them graded. We'd have results by the end of the day. We found if we send the cards over to be scored, we always had to wait a day or so. So we had those results. And then, and then uh, we would notify the advisors, and then they would place the student in the courses, which we recommended that they be placed in, on the basis of their scores on this test. Uh, and we would test them. 1,500, 1,800 students a semester. Now it's gone up. I believe they're testing even more, but they're, they're using computers. They replaced me and uh, Mrs. Bakhtai with computers. Mm -hmm. uh, we're not needed anymore, but we were very efficient. We got the job done you twice a day, good. twice a day. Yeah, pretty good yeah, amount of time. Four weeks, yeah, yeah. right. But, uh, yeah. And you, you did talk about the changes in the department, the, or in the, the school, and his yeah, and right. education, and uh, split off, the, it, right? Right, yeah. And the emphasis on uh, on research now. Mm -hmm. uh, to get tenure now is uh, uh, you, you have to have uh, real scholarship. Now. And when I came to the department, the PhDs were few, and now everybody has a PhD. Mm -hmm. uh, you're hardly hired. Unless you have, well, you can have a PhD pending, you know, you're, you're doing your prelims and so forth. You could do that perhaps. But then, of course, you went on a tenure track. There's that seven year period there. Mm -hmm. And heck, we didn't know what tenure even was. I was just around, and after seven years, they had to keep me, right? <laughs> it's a lot different then. Oh, yeah. Uh, we had some th interesting things in the department, if I, if I might mention those. Please we do. We had the, the Continental Comment TV program, which was on the air. Uh, television program. Uh, it involved uh, professors in the department in French and German and Spanish and a Professor Henderson from the Department of English uh, reporting on the British press. What we were doing, we were translating from these uh, European publications about news articles, what's going on over there, what do you think about the United States. When I came back from Moscow in 1965, Dr. Walther said, I'm going to put you on that program. We bumped off Spanish. So we had French, German, Russian, and English presses being reported. And I was the translator for, for the Russian newspapers, as the others were. So once a week, we would gather together and put on a half-hour program, recorded over in one of the FWA-8 buildings over there uh, by... Uh, uh, the back of the double E building. It's gone now. Where uh, Armstrong is? Uh, uh, pardon? Where Armstrong is, the FWA? No, where Knoy oh. Hall is now. Oh, in that, in that area, in that area. Armstrong, of course, replaced where I took chemistry. But the, uh, we would report on the, uh, what's, what's being printed in the European newspapers, and this was televised. Uh, they parted it on film. And then they would send these to various TV stations across Indiana and the United States. And we also had the same program on the radio, WBAA. We would gather together once a week. Of course, we had to change it a little bit then because we didn't have the visuals. But often we'd use the same material and we would talk about these things. And I did that for five, five six years. So uh, we were attempting again to get the information out to the people of the state of Indiana and beyond. We used to say the borders of the campus are the boundaries of the state. And that was our, that's all we had to do. We had to kind of present this kind of thing. And uh, so I did that for five years. So I would read a little bit in Russian first, then I would translate, we'd have pictures, we'd have slides, and we'd illustrate things, of course. And that was quite a thing. And we would get letters back and so on. Right. I still have some of the letters someplace. That's what you do after you retire, you go through all the boxes and not throw away things because you never know when you might need them. That's but I'm down to one now. <laughs> Pretty good. Uh, fundraising uh, for the university, that changed over time, didn't it? Yes, it did. <coughs> uh, you became more and more aware of it with the emphasis on research, on getting grants, on writing for grants. Uh, and of course, the uh, raising funds from the alumni. I don't know, this is just my memory, I don't remember we were that much concerned about that. Now, of course, fundraising has become very, very important. But uh, I think we got kind of, we get first, I would say, when I was either as a student or my first 10 years here at Purdue, 
we kind of got along with what the state legislature gave us when it finally got around to doing that. We always seemed that there was a delay. The legislature had not finished the, business. the budget and so forth, but I can't really talk much about that because I don't recall. But it has about. changed a lot over time. Yeah, I think it has. Uh, as I said, though, people were encouraged to write grants. And of course, uh, there was a, the, the uh, Na <coughs> National De uh, uh, Defense Education Act uh, provided for uh, teacher institutes nearly every year for about 15, my first 15 years at Purdue from 61 on. Teachers, who, high school teachers would be brought in for a, a uh, intensive program in French, German, and Spanish right here at Purdue. Language lab would be used. We'd make tapes for them to take home. And so that was the, what, what was the focus of our department for very many years, getting those teachers in and having that institute. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, during the summer. During the summer, summer institutes. Yeah, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. That was very important. All across the country, people were doing that. And uh, I guess as there's been a kind of a revival of that, they, they finally discovered that people in other countries don't all speak English. <laughs> oh, how about any awards and honors that you'd like to make a comment on? Well, I tell you, uh, for whatever reason, my name is on the Book of Great Teachers in the Purdue Union over here. Um, which surprised me quite a bit. I, I did get letters from students and so forth. But uh, what I was really involved is in sitting on those committees which decided such things as the Amico Teaching Award. That was the big award at that time. And we had to take uh, applications and documents from all across the campus and do the very tough job of deciding which one this would be awarded one of the Amico Awards. So I was on that teaching award committee for uh, several years, and uh, back, in the, back in the 70s. I did uh, uh, generate, create, wrote a, another program for television called Russia and the Russians, which was a 45 half-hour programs, again produced in that old old building over there, along with my producer, John Strathman, who was very, very, very capable. Uh, we worked together to put together 45 half-hour programs. Now, and that was also broadcast on local television, Channel 5, and also on in Indianapolis. And then the, the programs themselves were sold to different universities across the country through continuing education. This was something developed through continuing education. Yeah, they were the ones who funded it. Uh, Frank Byrne was very much interested in it in that time. And uh, I put that together. First we did it in black and white, believe it or not. Uh, that was uh, Jim Miles invited me over to his office in 72. And he asked me if I wouldn't do this. Because uh, he knew I'd been on television before. And he said, I think you could do this. And I remember his office at that time was over in the, uh, where the old Sir Lambert. Uh, they they shift, shifted people around in those years because they, hadn't, they didn't have the offices ready in Stewart Center yet. Stewart Center had just opened after a while. Well, no, it hadn't just opened. But they hadn't developed the basement yet. So they were doing that. And eventually, they moved the uh, production studio down there. But until about 1976 or so, it was still over there. Uh, anyway, Jim Miles' office was in Lambert. And as he was talking to me about this, I could hear basketballs up above hitting the floor. So he had an office with some extra noise in there. But anyway, I digress. Anyway, he asked me if I could do this. So we did it in black and white first. 45 programs, now a half an hour program, I should say, took about uh, 10 hours to produce. It, it, it took a long time because we had to script the whole thing. I used a teleprompter. Uh, it didn't, didn't want me to add living up there. You have to get that thing done in 27 and a half minutes for a 30 minute program. After we got it done, then I think it was Frank Byrne said, how would you like to do the program in color? Because we now are going to get in color equipment. Yes, folks, at one time they did not have color equipment and programs were in black and white. 
So we got the color equipment, so I did it all over again. And it, I think it even took longer because then we wanted to do it better. But we, uh, and again, uh, we were in the old building and I would go over there once a week and, and they could go under two programs and spend a lot of time again putting it together. A lot of slides. I still have about 10,000 slides around someplace. I don't know whatever is going to happen to them, but they're there. Uh, and uh, I, I suppose I could count that because it went, uh, uh, I had a, uh, a course at that time uh, and I would have people from uh, in the community at other different places. Then at the end of the semester, we'd come in, they would take a test. And they, uh, 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 they all passed really because I think it was a pass fail kind of thing. So we did, well, they did pretty well on that. And they seemed to enjoy it because it was a, it was a program designed not for the academic programs here, but for the people, just so they could get acquainted with what Russia meant to the Russians. I should tell you that when it was shown in Indianapolis, the folks down in Indiana protested that they're getting into their territory down there. I was teaching a course that had a Russian title on it, sponsored by the Russian Department of Continuing Education, if you like. But they were the ones who were supposed to be teaching Russian down there. And it was resolved at the highest level somehow, and they went ahead and showed it. Uh, I guess they looked at it and said, well, this is not really duplicating any of our courses. See, that was the right idea. And I don't think that concern, you know, we, we were supposed to teach above Highway 40. They taught below Highway 40. <laughs> but uh, that was the one thing I did. And maybe that's why my name is on that. I don't that's know. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. What are you doing in your retirement? Well, I retired in 95, and uh, I said to myself, now I can read books I've always wanted to read, <laughs> but could I supposed to read other books. Other than going through old boxes, I should tell you when I was teaching uh, in that, uh, well, both for the TV course and the Continental Comet, I subscribed to numerous publications from the Soviet Union. Every week they would come in. Well, folks. When you begin to get three and four newspapers a day, they start to accumulate. You cannot keep up with them. And at the end of my teaching, I had all these boxes full of newspapers and magazines. And with great reluctance, my first year of retirement, I had to go through those boxes and throw them away. Because that even though the library wanted, because the library already had its own publications, so I threw away a lot of stuff sorted things out, reading, uh, did a little bit of traveling, not a lot, uh, but uh, since, but I should tell you when you retire, uh, there's a saying, you wake up in the morning wondering, wondering what you're going to do, and when you go to bed at night wondering why you didn't get it all done. The days fill up somehow, and uh, then of course, uh, with having a computer at home, I find that I have access to information I never dreamed ever having access to. Uh, this generation won't know what it was to go to the library and, and look for a book in a card catalog and assemble uh, a bibliography on that basis. And now they download this and download that and they get all this information and I should say some disinformation as well. And, and, and they put it into a term paper. That isn't what we did then. And of course, uh, uh, being a, uh, simultaneously being an uh, instructor in Russian and in graduate school at Purdue, I had to take coursework here at the same time in the evening. And it sent me, sent me to the library in those card catalogs. I became quite well acquainted with them. Yeah. And uh, it was much more laborious. Now I can sit down and say if I want to, uh, find out anything about uh, Ivan the Terrible. I just Google Ivan the Terrible, and I get all this stuff, and it's almost overwhelming. It you have to. I have to. Uh, the say filtering is a challenge. The filtering is a challenge, and uh, I should tell you something else about the computers because they came in uh, to the faculty. When I started at Purdue, the main question was whether faculty members in my department where the faculty members should have a typewriter in them. Typewriter. You had secretaries for that. And in the foreign language department, modern language department, Calder Hall, first year of operation, second year of operation, 
the uh, chairmen of each language, French, German, Russian, and Spanish, had in their office a recording device which was linked to the main secretary, the principal secretary of modern languages. And they would dictate a letter or whatever they wanted to say into this recording device. And, and the secretary then would type it because professors didn't mean typewriters. Well, <laughs> that lasted about two years. And eventually they conceded, yes, Maybe we can put a typewriter in each office. Now, often professors shared, full professors shared the same office. See? Full professors didn't have their own offices in those years. And they would give typewriters. Okay. So I eventually I got a typewriter too. And we would, I remember typing all my tests. Sometimes you would make a rough copy and give it to, in this case, poor old Anna Bakhtai to type the thing onto a stencil. Now, a, sten a stencil was a device which used the impressions of keys to make, oh well, you made copies that way. You made copies from this machine, like dittos, things like that, all gone now. And about 1980, well, they said a uh, anniversary for Microsoft, 25 years or something, about 1984, somewhere in there. I remember somebody coming from the, uh, the computer center in the math building to our department asking whether anybody was interested in logging into the computer there, the master computer, mainframe, for any of their coursework or scholarship. Oh, no, I don't think we want to do that. I, and, and what about this? Can we have that? No, I wasn't much interested in doing that. And then, at that 1979, I was appointed as a language lab director. Now that was my job. The old language labs are much gone, or were gone or modified. And uh, I ordered two Apple IIe computers. And I invited the faculty, help yourself. And no one came. No one came. It was a revolution. In about a year, everybody was clamoring. After the first two years, no interest. And then it, late 80s, it was a clamoring for computers. Everybody had to have their own computer. And eventually, it happened. Well, that changed the focus of the language lab, where we were repairing Wallenzak tape recorders. That must be, somebody must give your uh, archives one of those Wallenzak tape recorders. Uh, then cassette players, we had cassette players, videotape machines, now, our language lab had to take over the immense problem of attending to computers in each office of each professor. And about that time is when I retired. I saw it coming, I said, this is beyond me. And, uh, and it, in a sense, we had two guys in the language lab, and I have to mention their names, Bill White and Harry Smith, who were geniuses with repairing anything from a tape recorder to a vacuum cleaner, hands-on kind of thing. But the electronics, now Bill Wyden was very good in that, it was just a new field. Everything changed. Everything changed in the, in the language lab, the way we made recordings. Then we went from uh, uh, Wallenzak tape to cassette machines. Now they're going out, now we have CDs. Now we have all these things. And, used to have in Colder Hall, we would have a tape recorder and a, a slide projector so, and, and a TV. And then eventually we had a tape, a uh, videotape player. Now that's all been replaced by, I'm sitting in this room, I'm looking up at that little thing. Those used to be about five times the size hanging from the ceiling. And all those things now, I suppose it's progress, but it has that's one of the changes I've seen. And, and when I often said, after 1995, I was kind of glad to leave. But I should tell you, in about year 2003 or four, they called me back, and he said to me, can you come back and teach us one course in Russian 101? I said, sure, I'll do that. So I got out some of my old materials, which were still good, and I had them reproduced. And I was going back into the classroom, and there I was. And using an overhead projector, I had a lot of overlays, 
I was using them, and I began to realize the students were missing something. They were sitting there with their laptops. And I was using the chalkboard, we used to call it a blackboard, chalkboard and overhead projector. Nothing moved except me. And I realized that I was out of date. I belong to the last century. And I've not gone back since. They, they appreciated that because you knew the language. It's just that they bring, they're so used to bringing those. That's right, of right. course. Right. But uh, at least I did not have the cell phones yet. I, a little towards the end there, I didn't have the cell or the text messaging and so forth. <laughs> but as I walked back through Colder Hall, I would see these students sitting on the benches now that we have with their laptops. And the, the, the fascinating thing, the amazing thing, is these are not connected to anything. The whole building now is wired. And that's one of the things that they were doing just as I was leaving. Mm -hmm. They were going back and putting in the Ethernet or whatever they call that thing. Right. And uh, that, that has been. Now, one final thing I might say is yeah. that uh, I remember hearing two professors walking down. They met each other in the corridor at Colder Hall. And one said to the other, I sent you an email. And I thought to myself, well, why don't you just tell him? And I think all the computers in the classroom and the offices has increased the isolation of professors and faculty, and faculty from each other. It's been a lot of time in front of those things where we used to go to the coffee room and interact and we'd see each other and after a faculty meeting we'd go down to Bruno's and, or Heidel, Heidelberg, we used to be down on Main Street and have a beer. I don't know if they do that anymore. Right. I've gone too long. Right. But the contributions that you have shared for the researchers in this conversation today is very helpful. I okay. really appreciate that, and I want to thank you. Well, thank you very much for listening to me. My pleasure. <laughs>